Welcome everyone. This is the next uh, webinar in our webinar series on digital technologies. Uh, this is our next webinar on the series on digital technologies for COVID-19. Uh, we have uh, two speakers today. I'm Craig Knobloch and uh, I'm co-hosting this with Baskar Krishnamachari. He'll be handling the questions at the end, but I'm gonna start out first by introducing our speakers in our talk today. So we have two speakers today. Uh, the first is uh, Dave Conti, who is a professor in the uh, Division of Biostatistics in the Department of Preventive Medicine and the Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center here at USC. Uh, he's a, also the Associate Director for Data Science Integration for the Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center uh, and the Kenneth, Kenneth T. Morris Jr. Chair in Cancer Prevention. So his research focuses on the study and design, study design and statistical methods for genetic and environmental epidemiology. Uh, in addition, we have Abigail Horn. Uh, Dr. Horn's a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Preventive Medicine at, the, at USC. Uh, and she's also a member of the Center for Applied Network Analysis. So she received her PhD from the Institute for Data Systems and Society at MIT. And she has a bachelor's in physics from the College of Creative Studies at UCSB. Uh, and her research interests involve network epidemiology, probabilistic modeling, and data science in the context of public health, with a focus on foodborne diseases and diseases of design, diet. Uh, and today, uh, both speakers are going to be giving a talk together on uh, the um, incorporation of risk factors in a stochastic epidemiological COVID-19 model for Los Angeles County. Uh, so a very relevant topic for us. And so uh, please uh, welcome our speakers. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So Abigail has been uh, leading the, the charge on this research. So she will be driving uh, the presentation for today. And I'll join in at a, a few key moments uh, here and there for a few slides on the risk modeling uh, part of it. Uh, and then uh, we'll go back and forth through some of the results. Great. And so I am just sharing my screen now. Um, okay, this is the uh, technical difficulties question. Can you see my slides or my notes? Now we've seen your notes. All right, so I just have to switch. There's a um, display button at the top of the screen there. I think that was. Yeah, there we go. Um, um, da, 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 da. How do I access this? Slide? There we go. All right, now you're seeing my um, slide? Yep, now it looks good. Excellent. Okay, so um, yeah, as as uh, Dave said, we've we've been working together on this, and um, it's this has actually been a really interesting project that has um, as a lot of <laughs> as all of the projects that are being presented in this in this webinar series um, has come into being very very recently, and um, actually through this whole collaboration in which uh, Dave and I have been working very closely. We actually haven't even met in person, but um, we've really gotten to um, enjoy in working together on this and um, combining efforts and working together with the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health to build this very LA specific model. And um, we'll talk a bit about what we, um, what are the factors that go into developing our, um, our academic model um, but as we, we mentioned in the abstract and, and in our title, um, really one of the key features of this model is the incorporation of risk factors and those relating um, not just to advanced age, but also to the existence of um, existing pre-existing health conditions or combinations of health conditions along with um, age and uh, health, certain unhealthy behaviors and the, the way that these combinations of factors um, influence the um, results of uh, an epidemiological model and also per, uh, allow the ability to do analysis um, on the, the populations who are most at risk. So um, that was 
an overview to our overview, um, but just to summarize a bit, what are the main questions that we have been that have been guiding this work? Um, so, you know, on the, the highest level, um, we want to predict epidemiological dynamics and at, look at the questions of when and how will the epidemic um, dynamics um, spread such that um, health care capacity is impacted and how can we help for example, the, the health department plan for those um, that the way that capacity is impacted. Um, what will happen to the dy dynamics of the epidemic when social distancing changes? So we want to be able to incorporate time varying parameters in this in this way so we can look at um, what happens when um, when parameters change as the um, epidemic evolves. And then how will the epidemic affect different at risk groups, as I, I just mentioned um, in, in my introduction. Um, so a few words on why our model is unique. Um, there are a number of there are countless models out there. Um, in addition to being a model that's really focused on Los Angeles County and its and its populations. Um, we are, we've, we've developed a stochastic approach, um, stochastic differential equation model, and we use uh, approximate Bayes calculations for parameter estimates, which we'll talk about a bit. Um, we, this allows us to present an uncertainty in all of our parameter estimates and our um, model projections going forward. Um, we incorporate external information to inform the prior distributions that we use for parameter specification and estimation. And, and we'll talk about that. Um, we vary parameters across time so we can enable the specification of certain interventions, for example, social distancing scenarios. And um, we incorporate risk factors as, as, we, as I've been talking about, so advanced age and health conditions and unhealthy behaviors. Okay, so um, first a few words on our model. Um, so we have, um, let's see, can I use my cursor here? Yeah. So um, we've all seen a number of SIR, SEIR models by now. Um, we have a number of compartments in our, in our model, but the ones that are important for the spread of the infection are just these, um, these compartments up here. So that susceptible group, the exposed group, the infectious group, and the recovered group. And um, this is the important, this is an important addition of our model. This group called A are the infected and undetected cases. So I and A are both contributing to new infections. And by including this A compartment here, we're able to estimate um, the, the full prevalence of the epidemic in, in the population and, and not just look at the numbers that are, are reported. Um, the, per, the compartments down here, um, hospitalization, intensive care, ventilation, and deaths um, are very important for healthcare planning, but not for the spread of the, of the epidemic. Um, I'm pointing with these arrows to a few of these, these parameters here, these um, these parameters with D, with, starting with a D are um, transition times. And these are fixed parameters that we get from the literature. Um, but the ones in red um, are estimated parameters, which we'll talk about in this presentation. And so, um, one of, so some of the, I'm pointing now to a few of the, the estimated parameters that are, are particularly important to the model. Um, so the infectivity rate, which we, we've probably heard about, um, and this is a standard um, model parameter um, important for the spread, um, the transitions between susceptible and um, infectious to uh, su susceptible to exposed and infectious. And the infectivity rate importantly is proportional, directly proportional to R0. Um, so we, we estimate R0 in our model. Um, we have this time dependent factor reduction in R0 this um, this mu function, and that's what uh, that what that is what allows us to specify social distancing scenarios. We incorporate this this because we have this um, compartment of the number of cases that are not detected. We have this ratio parameter of the proportion R is the proportion of illnesses that are detected out of all il illnesses. 
Um, then we have these um, illness severity probabilities. So probability of hospitalization given illness, probability of ICU care given hospitalization, and probability of death given ICU. So we'll talk about all of these. Um, but just briefly a word on how we include stochasticity in our model. Um, so we have a stochastic Eulerian discrete valued um, epidemic modeling approach that we use. And so in this model, we have, um, so we have um, discrete transitions between compartments. And the way that individuals move between compartments is encoded through, um, through probability distributions, depending on the type of transition, the number of individuals um, that transition from one compartment to the next are modeled by a Poisson, a binomial or a multinomial distribution. And so I'm showing you here an example of the, um, the probability distribution that models the, the transition, the, the number of transitions between um, the susceptible and the exposed compartments. And that's defined by the number of infectious cases. And that's a probability distribution that pulls from um, a, a Poissonian and a binomial distribution. Um, so each, with, with this kind of um, stochastic epidemic model, each e evaluation of the model with the same parameter values and initial conditions results in an ensemble of different epidemic realizations, um, hence the stochasticity. And um, so that's very important for our forward simulations and also for a parameter estimation procedure. Um, so also just, we'll talk about this more later, but in addition to the stochasticity of the disease transmission and evolution process, we bring in, um, we use, we have stochasticity in the parameter estimate. And so we'll talk about that. So um, in the previous slide, I, I showed some of the key parameters that are important to our model. Um, and we're gonna talk about those, uh, those particular ones now and the external sources of data that we use to specify these, these prior parameter distributions. So um, the first category of factors of, of um, prior parameters are those for the risk of severe illness. Um, so the probability of hospitalization given illness and the downstream probabilities from there. And the um, prior sources of information that we use are combinations of rates of, um, of probability or relative risk of severe illness from early COVID studies. And from um, we incorporate that with local demographic and health factor prevalence data. Um, so Dave will talk more about that. Um, then we'll talk about how we define a prior for the time varying factor reduction in R0 from mobility data and the fraction of undetected cases from seroprevalence studies. So um, Dave, do you wanna take it over? And you can, you can just tell me when to advance the slides. Yes, next slide. So um, early on, uh, studies were showing that there's, there was certainly an increased risk due to age, um, as well as other uh, comorbidities, including uh, immunocompromised, uh, BMI, smoking, and so on. Um, unfortunately, though, most of these early studies sort of produced data where it was looking at everything marginally or these individual risk factors one at a time. And what we really wanted to do was look at sort of what is the uh, independent or combination of these risk factors on uh, the disease process or the probability of hospitalization given illness, the ICU given hospitalization, and death given ICU. So if we had access to individual level data and we have these risk factors in epidemiology, what we simply can do is just uh, run conditional models, let's say in a logistic uh, regression type framework and we can get these conditional estimates and form a model that can be used uh, to estimate these probabilities. Um, the problem is, is we're only given marginal information. And so we had to uh, sort of borrow a statistical technique that was originally uh, designed and I think used uh, most often in genetic studies uh, for this situation. And I'll talk a little bit about that here. But what we wanted to do was come up with models for these different, these three different probabilities that you see in front of you, and then use those in two different ways. One is to really narrow down the prior distributions of those parameters in our epidemic model. So then we could then estimate from the data what these uh, probabilities are with more confidence. 
But then using the results from the epidemic model in terms of the counts of individuals in the stage of hospitalization or ICU or death, combined with the prevalence of these risk factors and their uh, combined effects to then do post hoc, I'll say stratified analysis, really sort of taking the output from the epidemic model and then mapping that with these prevalence and these risk factors um, into the different risk profiles that we've created to better understand who's going to be impacted by this epidemic model. So if we go forward, uh, slide, uh, the, the analysis technique that we did, and this is a method that we came up with and others have uh, done, done it in different situations, is we call it the JAM analysis for joint analysis of marginal effects. Uh, this is mainly used in genetic studies for fine mapping of GWAS uh, hits, or also uh, use the same sort of techniques as used in Mendelian randomization and other type of approaches like that. Um, up there on the equation on the right really is just the normal uh, sort of distribution representing linear regression where we regress Y on a set of risk factors X and we get the betas. And the arrow going down to the next line is the estimation of those betas, the joint effects of all of these, um, conditional on everything in the model. And that's just least squares regression. And so with individual level data, that's very straightforward. But without the individual level data, how can we perform that same analysis and get those uh, beta hats? And so what we can do is calculate the, the Z, which is this uh, X prime Y on the right here. And that's a function of the marginal relative risk that we can get from prior uh, data that's been published. And then also the X prime X, which is the correlation structure, we can get that from reference data. Um, and so we combine the two of marginal summary statistics, the frequencies of these risk factors, and then correlation structure from reference data. And we can combine that and get uh, conditional estimates of effect um, from marginal uh, risk estimates. So if we go forward, the next slide, uh, the data that we use uh, for the marginal relative risks are from studies of COVID-19. Uh, the main one that we used was an early study from the, um, the, the Chinese cohort of over 80,000 individuals that they uh, listed counts of hospitalization, ICU and death um, based on these single risk factors. Uh, the table that's over there on the right is the table that came from their uh, finally published uh, New England Journal of Medicine paper, but they also had a med archive paper um, that was much more informative and they had much more expansive tables there. And we were able to pull out um, a lot of the individual count data that we needed um, for the different risk factors to calculate um, those different marginal relative risks. Um, next, in terms of the, using the JAM model, we need reference correlation structure. There, we went to the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, the NHANES data, um, the most recent data. And there, we could pull out the relevant risk factor data um, from that for about uh, several thousand individuals. And then we could get the correlation structure. What we've done to represent sort of the LA County correlation structure, which is very diverse, is we've calculated the correlation structure for ethnic specific correlation structure. And then we use the weighted average to get an average um, correlation structure to use in our models. Um, and then finally, with the risk factor prevalence, we have uh, data on that from the Los Angeles County Health Survey, and then also from UCLA California Health. So all three of those things go into creating um, sort of these uh, risk models and risk profiles. And if we go to the next slide, um, the, the actual risk factor data that we looked at uh, consists of smoking, uh, current smoking versus none. Uh, we modeled any comorbidity as a function of diabetes, hypertension, and you can see the list there. Uh, so we were guided a little bit by sort of the limitations of what we can do with the statistical analysis. Um, well, it would be really nice to look at the independent impact of each one of these comorbidities, um, both the sort of marginal risk factor data and also the NHANES correlation structure doesn't allow us to have sort of, I'll say the statistical robustness that we need to perform that analysis. We had to do sort of um, aggregation of those comorbidities into one single um, sort of any effect of any comorbidity. Uh, we modeled age. Um, as three different groups for the risk factor analysis with age 20 to 44 being the reference group, and then using sort of an ordinal increase in risk of going from the 20 to 44 reference group to 45 to 64, and then 65 plus. There are individuals that are over 70, 80 plus within the data that we used 
um, to get sort of that upper um, sort of marginal risk factor data on age. Um, but we also assume that those lower than 20 had a relative risk of one. Uh, and similar type of uh, analysis for BMI, we categorized that into three groups. So using this analysis and then the, the, the or using the marginal uh, relative risks for these risk factors and then the JAM analysis, we can go to the next slide and see the comparison of the marginal relative risk there on the left um, and the conditional relative risks on the right. Um, and we can look at this for the three different parameters or the three different models that we're interested in, in terms of the probability of hospitalization, given that you're ill, the probability of uh, ICU, given that you're hospitalized, and then the probability of death. So general statements between you know, patterns of the marginal relative risk to the conditional relative risk is that there's a general decrease uh, in the impact of age once you condition on comorbidity, smoking, and BMI. Uh, there's also a general decrease in the BMI of that as well. Uh, and comorbidity goes down. Um, and so that's just reflecting that it's not one of these factors that's really driving this. They're all acting additively, but we are taking into account um, that correlation structure between those risk factors. Um, another thing of interest, though, is if you look across from hospitalization to the ICU to death, um, I think it's very interesting to look at the any comorbidity factor. Um, and it looks like it still has an effect um, on the probability of hospitalization, but um, the effect of ICU and death is close to one. Um, and so this has been, there's been some other recent publications that have shown that comorbidities may not play um, a substantial role in sort of the ICU and death component, but more on who gets hospitalized if they are ill. So, um, so this is a comparison of the uh, conditional relative risks to the marginal relative risks. What we did next is then, take these estimates of uh, relative risk for these different risk factors, and we create a model for the probability of hospitalization. So we can combine these linear combinations of risks within a logistic regression type of model. And then we can outline what is the specific probability of hospitalization for any given risk profile or any combination of these risk factors. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we created different risk factors. Um, and you can see, I'll just point out the, the, the second line first. This is sort of our lowest risk category group where it's the youngest, zero to 19, uh, BMI below 30, non-smoker, no comorbidity. It has a, a prevalence in the LA population of 14%. Uh, percent. And you can see that those probabilities, this is our baseline group. So we had to specify what these absolute probabilities of hospitalization, ICU, and death are. And given sort of the, some of the Chinese data and some other data that we've seen, we gave a small probability for the hospitalization, but probability of ICU and death, we set to zero. So risk is all relative to this baseline group for the other risk uh, groups going up. You can see that that top risk uh, group there, the risk three, um, this is the most common uh, risk profile, uh, 45 to 64, BMI less than 30, non-smoker com um, with comorbidity. And then you can see the relative, the corresponding probabilities um, uh, for that. Um, what we can do then across all of these different risk profiles is, is take a LA County population prevalence weighted average for each one of these probabilities and create a prior for our model specification. And that's what we've done for the prior specification within the epidemic model. Furthermore, what we can do is once we get a single estimate of the probability of hospitalization given illness from the epidemic model, we can then sort of back calculate with the prevalence and these individual risk calculations into the different risk groups. And that allows us to sort of project out what is the risk for each individual risk group. Uh, so next slide, and I think I hand it over to Abigail. At this yeah, stage. great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and just one thing about this table. So we're just showing an ep excerpt of this table um, because we have these numbers of, of combinations of risk factors. Um, if you, you go to our website, which we'll, we'll go to um, at the end of this talk, we have the full table where you can go in and search for the different combinations of risk profiles, there are like 40 different combinations that are meaningful combinations of risk factors that we have these, um, these, probabil these probabilities of illness severity um, calculated for. Um, 
Okay, so the next prior that we'll talk about is that for the time varying factor reduction in R0. And um, I mentioned this briefly when I was showing the model, but it's important to be aware that the um, R0 is directly proportional, R0, which is the um, fraction of new cases um, caused by, on, on average, by any infectious individual in a completely susceptible population. Um, we're all very familiar with R0 by now. Um, but uh, so R0 is directly proportional to the contact rate. So when we talk about reductions in um, R0, we talk about, it's equivalent to talking about um, reductions in the contact rate. So um, we use mobility data um, and this is both data coming from um, uh, smartphone geolocation um, that's being um, aggregated by a number of data providers and, and shared right now um, with researchers through uh, COVID initiatives, COVID research initiatives. Um, so we use this mobility data to narrow the specification in the reduction in the average number of new infections due to infected person. So it's it's really too hard to use this kind of data to specify the actual kind of nominal uh, contact rate. So what we do is we estimate an R0 value at the, um, at the beginning of the epidemic um, before we have a reduction. And then we use this mobility data to specify a factor reduction in that. And so what I'm showing you on the right here is um, mobility data from um, Unicast, which is one of these location, these uh, geolocation um, data service uh, aggregators and, and providers. I'm showing you their um, metric for the difference in encounter densities, which is a, which is a, um, a proxy for the contact rate. And then I show you below here what our modeled distribution of R0 um, is as a function of time. And so we can really set any functional form here. Um, we've found this one is, is doing well for the, um, uh, given the, the, the epidemic that we're seeing, um, this, this fits the, the data the best. And we, um, we estimate, um, we have a prior from the mobility data on this reduction factor. And we use, that, we use that as a prior. And then in the model estimation, we um, estimate the, the drop. Um, we estimate this drop and then we estimate this increase. So um, a lot of flexibility here in our model specifications for incorporating this, this time varying parameter. But of course, um, and sorry if I haven't been clear enough about this already, but we are, uh, we, we use a, um, a single population, a, a homogeneous population model, a random mixing model. And so when I'm talking about contact rate here, um, it's an average for the entire population. And, and at the end, we'll talk about, you know, ways that we can start to break that down um, to get more, more fine grained, um, um, perspectives into the epidemic spread here. Okay, so the third prior is the prior for R, the fraction of undetected cases. Um, we use um, a seroprevalence study conducted by um, Professor Naraj Sood, who is a professor um, at USC in, in public policy. And um, Naraj conducted this, this study in conjunction with the, the um, Department of Public Health. And so, um, so far, what we have from them is a single data point, which is the prevalence of antibodies in the population um, around the beginning of April. And so, so we, we use this, this data, or essentially this, this data point, to inform two pieces of information in our model specification. So one is the prior distribution for R, the fraction of observed illnesses over all illnesses. And just to note, so this antibody study gives us um, the prevalence um, at this time in early April of the population. Then separately, we have from the county health department um, 
counts, we have the observed illnesses. And so we take together that estimate of what the actual prevalence is with our number of what the observed illnesses was at that time. And so that helps us to estimate the unobserved illnesses. And then we use that as the prior for that fraction of unobserved illnesses, or it's actually the fraction of observed illnesses. And then um, we use, um, in, in addition to specifying this prior for the this fraction of observed illnesses, we use this one data point as um, an actual data point to fit to in the number of counts in the recovered compartments, in compartment rather. Um, and so we, it's, what we know is when illnesses started, we actually estimate that um, the, the start time of the epidemic. Um, and so we can go back in time and say, okay, we know on, as of, um, it's actually, we say around a week before April 10th, um, what the um, recovered uh, population was. And so we can go back in time and say, you know, at the beginning of the epidemic, what, th there, there were no recovered cases. And so that actually provides us a series of data points that, that is another data stream um, that we use for fitting the model. Okay, so that um, was a bit about parameter estimation procedure, but we'll talk about it more, um, more specifically here. So um, we use, uh, I just talked about uh, how we use the recovered data points for parameter estimation, but the, the full picture of what we do here for parameter estimation is to use the counts of illnesses, hospitalizations, um, ventilations, um, deaths, and then, like I just talked about, these recovered cases. And so um, this has really been being able to use all of these parameters and not just the infected counts or the, or the death counts, but also these hospitalizations and ventilations. Um, this has really helped to specify our model. And this we've been um, lucky to be able to work with and um, be be able to have access to data shared by the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. So um, they're doing these weekly, I mean, daily updates on um, all of these variables each day. And so we can feed those into our model for parameter estimation. An important thing to note um, is that when we do this fitting from all of these compartments, we remove the counts from nursing home cases. So um, right now, as of, as of now, um, nursing home deaths from the nursing home population, deaths from outbreaks in nursing homes, um, contribute to almost 50% of all of the deaths that we've, been, we've seen in LA County. And we found that if we include those counts, we get really high, um, we get really high estimates for the, the probability of death given illness and um, just kind of outrageous model parameters because we're essentially fitting to this very, very high risk group. So we, we found that if we wanna do a general LA County model, we really have to actually remove the counts from nursing homes. So we do that and we have to do that to all the compartments that we fit to. So please note going forward that in all of the model projections we provide, these are for the LA County population without that nursing home population, which which is important, which that's a very important population for the spreading the parameter, but it really because there's such a high risk group and as Dave was mentioning, um, the, you know, we have these different age, um, ordinal age categories, they're at the end, you know, the, the higher, the average age in nursing homes in, in um, the state of California is around 87. So they're at the very upper range of the age limit and that they have a completely, a much higher risk than that that we see in the general population. So we separate those, those out. Um, okay, so how do we do parameter estimation? We use approximate Bayesian computation. Um, this, is, uh, we, this means we use a Bayesian framework where our model parameters are random variables and um, we specify prior distributions for these random variables and we estimate the, the posterior distribution for these parameters. And, um, the benefit of using ABC, um, approximate Bayesian computation, is that it allows us to estimate 
you know, this multi, this, this complex set of parameters that um, is not possible to do in a kind of mechanistic model like this um, that we've developed. Um, it's not possible. So in this kind of model, it, a likelihood function is, um, is not possible to write out. And so this, this um, parameter estimation procedure allows us to estimate all of these parameters, um, even though we can't write out that likelihood uh, function. And we're able to do that by including this prior information and uncertainty around each prior parameter. And so what that means is that for some of our priors, we, we have to specify them very tightly to be able to um, get a reasonable fit. And so we, you know, this has been, there is, this is, this is where the art in the approach lies is in how we specify these prior distributions and what um, parameters we give flex more flexibility to than others. Um, so um, just one more note is that the um, ABC techniques allows us to easily kind of um, weight higher or specify um, the specify that the estimation procedure is relying more on data that we trust more than other data points. For example, we trust more the death counts than the illness counts, right, for, for a number of reasons. So we can um, weight those counts higher in our estimation procedure. Um, and how, how do we estimate uncertainty? So that's how we estimate our parameters. How do we estimate our uncertainty? And what, um, what I mean by that is in our, in our model projections or simulations um, going forward. So this, the ABC um, parameter estimation approach that we just talked about produces this, th these um, posterior pr um, parameter distributions. And actually what it produces is um, not just a series of um, marginal parameter distributions, but a series of uh, joint posterior estimates. And so what I'm showing you down here are um, joint posterior densities between um, just two parameters at a time. Um, we have one parameter, the other parameter, and their, their um, joint density. Um, now we have a set, there's a set of um, eight or nine different parameters that we're estimating. And so in our forward um, projections, we sample um, values from this joint posterior distribution um, across these eight or nine parameters. And so that gives us um, a range of uncertainty. And then, as I mentioned um, at the beginning, um, we also have uncertainty um, incorporated through the um, stochasticity of the model um, in, in the way that the number of transitions between compartments are encoded through these um, binomial or multinomial uh, or Poisson distributions. Okay, and so we are now transitioning to the model predictions component. Um, and what, what we show in all of this, and, and we'll show these kind of predictions quickly here. We wanna be able to get to the website so we can kind of there's a ton of information on there and a, total, a lot of different model uh, predictions, projections, analyses. And so we wanna kind of just give an overview of what's in there. Um, but just wanting to highlight that a lot of the, the model predictions that we show, we, we have um, a mean, actually, I think we've taken away the mean value from a lot of our predictions because it's less meaningful when we have this huge range of uncertainty. So we use the median and then we have this dark shaded um, region, which is the 50% um, confidence interval and the 90 and the, the light shaded region, which is the 95% confidence interval. So um, let's start, let's go through some of these model parameters. Um, Dave, would you wanna uh, talk through some of this? Yeah, so um, I mean, quickly, because we do wanna give time for uh, people to give, uh, yeah. to have questions. I mean, of course, uh, a, a couple of the, the things that public health uh, individuals are most interested in is the case fatality rate um, and, and ultimately the infectious fatality rate. Um, the, the difference being that the case is for the number of observed illnesses and the infection is for the total number. And in our case, we estimate that in terms of the, the observed plus of, um, the unobserved. And then also this table gives um, the different probabilities of hospitalization as well as are not 
estimated uh, sort of at the beginning of the outbreak and then what that reduction is. And so if we look at that top line, this is the median estimation, we can see that the case fatality rate is about 3.56, where the infectious fatality rate is about 0.11. And again, this is for the general LA County. It excludes um, uh, nursing home within that, um, but it is estimated for the overall population. Uh, we have, in terms of the fraction of observed illnesses that we um, observed, this is very low. Um, so there have been various estimates out there in terms of, um, I've seen things from 80 to 90%. We're saying that there's about, we're only observing 2.8% of that. Um, again, this is based and informed by only one seroprevalence study that we have in LA County to do that fraction. And that fraction happened fairly early on in the epidemic in April. And so this may have changed over time and we need to get more information sort of from a, you know, new seroprevalence studies to inform what that fraction is. Across that time period, testing has also changed in terms of the amount of testing going on. Um, and so uh, that uh, plays a key role um, in estimating that fraction. And then you can see that we do have, um, I'll just go to the, the far right over there, that the probability of death given ICU, even in uh, excluding um, the nursing home counts is still pretty high in terms of it being uh, about 72% if you're in the ICU um, across all of LA. If we go to the next slide. Uh, this just uh, shows quickly sort of how well our uh, model projections for the various components and the cumulative components uh, fit uh, relative to the uh, observed data. And you can see that, you know, in general across um, all of these, the new observed infected uh, individuals have a lot of uh, variability. Um, and then it's really the cumulative observed infection that's much more constant. And that's what we can um, get a lot of estimation. So I'll say uh, for robustness in our estimation. Um, the, if you look at the new observed infected, you can see that there is a slight trend in the uh, um, observed going up, but we weight more heavily and we put a little bit more sort of emphasis on the new deaths. Um, to sort of drive a lot of our estimation because the total number of infected is really an unknown uh, parameter that really feeds how many get um, observed infected that we observe. Uh, next slide. Um, this just gives you a snapshot of the current predicted of those individuals that would be currently in the hospital um, across a, a, a time frame there on the, the bottom. Um, you can go to the website and you can hover above the different components of these sort of projections and you can get uh, the median estimate. So for uh, June 19th, we estimate about 420, 419 um, individuals to be in the hospital and that can go up in the 95th percentile uh, up to 3,900. So, mm -hmm. and that's close to the capacity of the hospitalization in LA County. And that's one of the main things we wanted to do was estimate when would we reach sort of capacity in terms of the number of hospital beds, the number of ICU beds and the number of uh, deaths. So next slide. Um, and this goes to uh, taking that information in terms of what we just saw there, the pattern overall in terms of the number of hospitalization and going back to the risk stratified groups and saying, okay, what's the prevalence of those? Uh, in LA County, what's the different probabilities of those different um, groups, and how would that then be sort of projected on that? And really, it's just sort of a visualization technique of saying, okay, of those that are hospitalized, how would they break out into our five different risk category groups? And you can see that the biggest in terms of the number is our risk category three, but there is a substantial number um, in the higher risk one and two as well in the hospitalization. And then like we've seen in the real data, there is also um, individuals that are in the hospital from the other risk categories. So next slide. Um, we can do this as well um, by using the prevalence of the, um, the populations in terms of race and ethnicity. And again, project that onto um, uh, the, the projected uh, um, hospitalizations that we have or the estimated numbers. And then we can see what's the relative uh, expected impact on each population. Um, go, go forward here. Um, and then finally, here's the cumulative deaths and we can see this across time using the um, uh, 
estimation and the estimated R naughts, assuming that everything will go into the, in the future and how we would project on that. And you can see we can get up to uh, close to, I think it's about 4,000 deaths by uh, August is expected with the median. Next slide. And we can take that distribution and again, uh, put on our risk strata, strata. And you can see then this is very different than what we saw in terms of the um, expected sort of risk profile distribution for hospitalization, this is different for cumulative deaths because again, those at the higher risk will have a higher probability of being in the ICU and a higher probability of death. And so that proportion increases here in the number of uh, deaths across time that we would see. And so we see in, in our model, because of our pr prior parameters, we have nobody in sort of risk category five that are uh, estimated to die. And we'll move forward. I we do wanna give some time. So I'm gonna, we'll skip this one. Uh, we'll quickly go over some social distancing and we'll do some conclusions here. Abigail, do you want to do this? And then we'll quickly move forward because we want to give time for questioning. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the, the, the way that we encode these social distancing scenarios is that we look at um, percentages um, of uh, the original, we, we simulate in the percentages of the original R0 going from what our current estimate of the reduction, the factor reduction, this is that um, mu as a function of T factor reduction in, in R0, um, going all the way up to 100%, which would be the original R0 or the original contact rate. And so um, we, we show these in terms of what they mean to the effective R0. So this actually, this is what our current effective R0 is. Um, and we show what a percent increase from our current R0 they represent as well. And so we're not going to go over these in detail, but um, just to show that we can, we, you know, th this, is the, this is the way that we, we try to analyze what these different um, scenarios would result in, um, in terms of um, what I'm showing you on the top are hospitalizations and on the bottom are deaths. Um, if we begin these scenarios where the um, R0 increases um, due to um, easing social distancing um, uh, requirements or practices um, going forward. And so um, we, we see that uh, for these, this is the hospitalization rates and we, we see that these do exceed the capacity with a, with a high likelihood when we start really increasing the R0 and you can't see the um, you you can't see these numbers here for the actual death counts that we're estimating if we increase R0 all the way back up um, starting from now going forward but you know we get into the 20 the tens 20,000s so um, really want to avoid these situations um, so so yeah like Dave said we we have a we're going to skip over this. Um, this is in the website. There's there's a ton of analysis that's possible with this model, but we want to just kind of talk about some some general conclusions um, and then take some Q and A. Um, so so what we've seen from this this model that's specific for LA County, um, we have seen that LA County has succeeded in mitigating an initial large initial epidemic wave. Um, a lot because of the early action that was taken. And um, what the current um, increase in mobility that we're seeing now translates into is going to mean a long plateaued epidemic curve. So you might have noticed in the figures going forward, we kind of had this long, instead of this peak, we have this long flat plateau with maybe a little bit of an uptick. Um, and so we've seen so far around a 25% increase from the beginning of May to June in contact rates. And that of course is gonna lead to some increase in um, the infectivity rate and the spread. Um, risk factors in the Los Angeles County population. So we, we haven't talked about this in detail in terms of the post hoc analysis that we've been able to do of the risk factors, but really one in very important finding and you can see this more on the website, um, some of the, the visualizations on the website, is that the um, risk factors, as we model them in, 
they contribute to but do not explain the um, count, the case count data that LA has demonstrated in certain um, at risk or you know dis, uh, health disparities population groups. So um, that's a really important finding, and we want to um, dig that dig that apart in um, future um, work in this model. So we want to really create. Um, you know, I mentioned this is a this a homogenous um, mixing a homogenous population model assuming um, assuming a well mixed population that's not the case. Um, we want to be able to bring in these um, different mixing parameters um, that we see for that we would see for different groups and different populations. And importantly, because we're looking at the, how risk is stratified with these different populations like race ethnicity groups, we can model these groups. We would like to model these groups separately and um, do this spatially as well. And so um, be, be able to really incorporate what we see about the certain mixing rates and dynamics and the contact patterns that we see with these different groups and what and how that can help to explain the patterns that we're seeing because the risk factors alone do not explain that. Um, so we have this website, please take a look. Um, and um, we, we want to thank our, our team and um, we've, we've had a lot of support um, from um, a PhD student in, in our department, uh, Lai Jiang. Um, uh, research programmer, Emil, um, sorry, I can't pronounce the last name. And then um, Wendy Kozen, who's been a, an advisor and a, um, who's, a, who's a professor in our, in our department, um, a prof professor of preventative medicine. Um, and then thanks also to the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health for, for frequent conversations with us and, and the great resources that they've provided in the data. So thank you. Great, thank you so much for uh, the presentation. Uh, we have a number of questions, so I'll read them out to you and uh, it'd be great if you can respond. Uh, so there were a couple of questions about the compartmental, the diagram uh, with the arrows between different states. Um, and so I think a couple of our questioners are asking why there isn't an arrow from V uh, to D or V from, from V to D or V to R um, and why does it sort of V look like a, an absorbing state in that in that sense? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. So it's because we didn't have any um, good data on what happens with the the ventilations, including um, the I mentioned that the um, the transition times between compartments. Um, those are fixed parameters that we take from COVID literature that we've seen. We weren't able to find, um, and you know, we could probably go back now and find some better data and update this. Um, but when we were initially building, we building this, we couldn't find good um, estimates on the transition times from um, ICU to ventilation, the act, the ratio of um, patients that went um, into ventilation directly from the hospital or through the ICU, and then from ICU to recovered. So we kind of just model this as a fraction of all of those case, those patients that go to ICU, which is the best data that we were able to get, um, which is, um, is and that is a, a, one of the parameters in our model is that fraction of cases, but the prior distribution on that, um, on that fraction of cases that, of all the cases in ICU that require ventilation, that's the only parameter that we had from the literature to specify that. So it's just a point, it's, it's just a compartment in there to be able to fit to the data that we have from the health department on the, the um, counts of ventilation, but it doesn't feed into the dynamics of the model. Great. Um, we have a couple of questions that have to do with, you know, ha have you looked at how these risk numbers and factors compared to other diseases uh, and a related question is, um, if R0 depends only on the contact rates, why, you know, wouldn't it also be different across diseases? Um, so, I mean, oh, R0 is, is, is a function of contact rate, um, but it's also a fun function of other things as well, is there, you know, the, the probability of an infection, you know, if two individuals come in contact in, in that. Um, so, 
I, mean, but I think maybe, you know, in our talk, what we're using is the mobility data to give us an idea of the reduct, the sort of expected reduction in R naught only. We're not, uh, so we're not modeling sort of if people are using social distance, uh, if they're using masks or if they're washing their hands and what that impact would be. Um, I mean, this is one of the biggest problems with sort of this uh, modeling in this framework of just variation in R naught because it doesn't have a direct translation to a lot of these things in terms of wearing masks and, and, and that type of thing. And there needs to be sort of more connection there. So when we do the social distancing scenarios, we have a better idea of, in addition to contact rate, you know, rates and mobility, what else could be impacting or not. Um, another question is, uh, what was the original R0 before mobility prior, and what was the lowest R0 after applying social distancing prior? Oh, that's a good question. So the um, I'd have to go back a few slides, but the original R0 was around 4.1, something like that, 4.1, 4.15. Um, that might sound really high. Um, Actually, if you compare SIR models to SEIR models, um, that R0 estimate for an SEIR model um, is, is uh, close to a lot of what other people are get, other models are finding in other, in other locations. Um, so that might sound high. We, we, we might hear that the, uh, the R0 for, um, for reasonably dense populations like Los Angeles is closer to 2.5, but that, that's our original R0 for an SEIR model um, when we're also factoring in that um, fraction of undetected cases. Now, the lowest um, R0 that we've seen was hovering around one and just below one. And it's gone up to, um, I think, what I just showed, 1.1 mm -hmm. something. So we're we're above one, we're close to one, but we're we mm -hmm. we we were below and now we're above. And a related question is whether you adjusted your uh, original R zero based on the data from additional testing. Right. So the that's an interesting question. The testing, the early testing. If we're talking about the seroprevalence, the antibody test, um, that was conducted um, after the original R0. Um, that, not the, rather, that was conducted after the, um, the huge drop in R0 and contact rate that we saw. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't factor directly into that, except that, and I explained this. Um, very briefly, but the way that we factor in that antibody test is we assume that at that one point of time in early April, there is a certain number of recovered cases. And we know that at the beginning of the outbreak, there were zero recovered cases. So at some time in between that, we have this curve modeled and, and that would help to factor into the original R0 estimation, but that's gonna have a small impact. Um, and so, so largely our R0 our original R0 estimation is not factoring in the testing data or the seroprevalence data. I know we're running low on time. Uh, let me see if I can prioritize a couple of the questions here. Uh, one of them uh, is asking that uh, in your projections, there's a long plateau, but there's no second wave. Uh, what are you assuming about the MUT going forward? Oh, great. Yeah, that's important. I didn't um, clarify that. So we are, when in the projections going forward from now, <laughs> We assume um, this, I showed that um, kind of uh, the R, uh, modeled R0 as a function of time. And we saw that like steep um, fall early on. And then we've, and then we had uh, like a flat rate um, for a little while, which was the value that was just below one. And now we're seeing this steady incline, but in the forward projections, um, this is why the scenario analyses are important because in the scenario, in the mm -hmm. forward projections that are posted on the site as our like best working projections going forward, they assume that the contact rate go, or the R0 going forward is what it is as of today, as of the day that the model was fit. 
And so that's underestimating very likely the increase in mobility that we're that we're going or the increase in contact rate that we are seeing actively and that we will continue to see. I'll just add though that I think you know although there is a slight plateau, there is you know for high levels of effective R in some of the scenarios, there is a peak. And so, you know, when mm -hmm. in the later scenarios, we do see in terms of hospitalization and other sort of hospital system type related components, there is a peak uh, that may go over sort of capacity. So there's just uh, maybe for our last question, there's two questions that I'll try to combine together. Uh, one uh, asks that in your graph, it looks like there are a lower number of blacks compared to Latino and white, which seems different from other cities. And another question is, uh, are there any data available that uh, can allow risk factors to encompass things like race, work, economic status, and not just indirectly how yes. the social determinants might create underlying conditions. So, yeah, we, um, I mean, that's one of the big things and we kind of uh, unfortunately had to gloss over that slide at the end. But yes, we are, we are not estimating what is the sort of distribution of cases across ethnic groups. And why that is, is because what we're doing is, is, this goes back to the epidemic model, and we're assuming a homogeneous population of mixing and transmission at that early stage across all individuals, irregardless of their ethnicity, and then that just sort of propagates down by risk factors. And the risk factor distribution does not explain the race distribution at the end in terms of the probability of death. And so what is explaining that is that it's not equal mixing the transmission and the infections are differentially impacting different ethnic groups way at sort of the early stage of our epidemic. And so that drives sort of the, the, the future research. What we need to do is have a multi-population model that allows the epidemic dynamics to be different across populations. And that will probably capture some of that as well. Uh, I think I'm gonna risk one last question. I know we're okay. all time, but I'm gonna risk this last question here. Mm -hmm. uh, it said that you eliminated nursing home residents from your analysis because they would skew the results for the general population. But what happens when you analyze only nursing home residents? Can you create a model for those folks and compare them to age-matched individuals who are living at home? It's a great yeah, idea. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a great idea. Um, so the, well, we would love to do that. Um, time is an issue. So when you, when we, we've talked about building a, a nursing home specific model, but you can't use a single population for that because we have all of these clustered isolated communities. Um, they're not totally isolated. There's um, influx and outflux through the, the workers. And sometimes these, um, the, the staff will work at multiple nursing homes. And so that's a really um, high um, risk of transmission between nursing home settings, but um, really we have, you know, all of these independent population, otherwise independent populations that have a cap on, that has a certain population size. And so you can't um, assume that the total spread within that community is going to just mm -hmm. be a function is going to, that, it's not a, an, um, an, a well mixed population. So we'd have to develop it, these independently, but um, it would be really important to do a model like that. And, um, you know, I, I wish we had more time and we could get into all of the details and incorporate these really important populations who are seeing, you know, taking a huge brunt of the, the burden of this mm -hmm. illness. Thank, thank you so much for an amazing talk. Uh, a lot of questions. We still have a, a few on the table, but unfortunately we're out of time. Uh, but thank you so much for this presentation. We encourage really those to feel free to email us if they have questions and yeah, please. continue the conversation. Great. Thank you both. Thank you thank all. Thank you. And thanks for everyone for joining us today.